Well, let's get our Bibles, and if you want to use the handout to refer to, uh, you can go ahead and get that out. So you turn and uh, get your Bibles out, and we can get our handouts as well. And so tonight we'll be continuing. This is part six. Everybody's right. Part six of our study of the attributes of God. Who is like you? And of course, I have it as a question mark for the title of the series, of course, because so far we've seen obviously no one is like God. He's unique and special, one of a kind for sure. Um, But uh, we've been studying some of the attributes of God. Now, before we get started, I'm going to ask another trivia question here, and this is for all of our wood woodsmen, no, wood makers. All right, so here you go. Here's the question. Of what wood or what type of wood was Noah's ark made? Gopher wood. Okay, now where do you find that? Uh, 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 no. The little guys on the ground, you can go for the wood. In the Bible, where would you find it? I'd ask a gopher if I could. So you'd ask the gopher where to do the chapter in reference. It's actually, that is true, gopher wood is the wood that was used, Genesis 6, 14. So if anyone ever asks you to give evidence for the hope that you have in gopher wood, Genesis 6, 14 is the answer. That is gopher wood, yep. Do you know where it's from, where you find it, did you say Oh, no, Genesis 6.14 is where you find the answer. <laughs> oh, oh, that tells you where it's at? Oh, no, I don't know. Oh, oh, oh I thought you meant like... Where did you find the wood? Yeah, it's like down in the lowlands or up in the top. Or maybe, Never seen gold wood. Never burned it. I don't know what the BTU value is of it. Must be unique. <laughs> it, we'll must say, be it must be decay resistant. I'll, I'll say it floats, decay, yeah. but I also think it's water repellent, right? Yep. <laughs> I think Noah told his boys, he says, you guys go for wood. Oh, very well done. All right, so I got you at least thinking a little bit there, obviously. Uh, Is this all recorded? Yes. <laughs> Remember, we're being recorded live out on the Internet. But anyway, so again, we're starting tonight, uh, we're looking at rather tonight part six of our study of the attributes of God, what is God like, what is he not like, and we turn to his word, as I have said, the written, but of course incarnate word, meaning Jesus, uh, to get a better understanding of who he is, and of course as we do that, one of the things we want to do is to know the one that we what love, serve, and worship, uh, and so one of the ways we do that is to study the attributes of God. Um, I've been using this as the definition, just to refresh your memories. Uh, Stephen Waterhouse's book, Guide to Bible Doctrine, which is the one, I told you it's out in the um, foyer there on the library cart, if you want to use it for something. Uh, It's a little bit unique, meaning usually a theology book is primarily text, meaning somebody's written something. Uh, Waterhouse is particularly helpful because he outlines things just using mostly scripture, uh, so it's it's a good, helpful source, but uh, it's limited in its comments. But what he does say about the attributes of God is, if you remember on the handout, the attributes of God are those qualities which are essential, permanent, and distinguishing features of his person, of course, because God is unique as well. Now, there are 16 attributes that we plan to cover, plus one. So we're going to have, remember, plus one. Someone had asked me, what is jealousy? In other words, how is God a jealous God? And how do we, in a sense, balance that with we need to avoid jealousy? So we're going to cover 16 by the time we finish, plus one. The one is a bonus freebie, and uh, that one will be jealousy. Now, so far, if you look at the sheet there, uh, the list, we've covered 11. So if you remember so far, we've seen that God is eternal. Remember, all of us are going to spend eternity somewhere, but the distinguishing aspect of God that we don't have is God has no beginning. You know, God is an eternal being. So eternality isn't always looking forward, at least in terms of God. Uh, God's eternal. We've seen that he's good. Uh, he's gracious. He's holy. Uh, we looked at that one that's eminence, you know, similar to omnipresence, but eminence has this idea of nearness, closeness, intimacy. Um, God has a desire to be close to his people. And then we've looked at just or justice. 
We've looked at love, God's love, and uh, one of the things you remember about God's love is God's love is not an emotional love. Uh, we tend to think of it as sort of this warm, fuzzy, gooey feeling, and we found largely it's uh, the cross uh, in many ways, First John chapter 4. We've looked at mercy, and then last week we looked at the first of three of the three omnis, as if you might could refer to it. So last week we looked at omnipotence, omnipresence, and so this week we'll look at the, the third of the omnis, omniscience. So tonight we're going to look at omniscience and then righteousness. Now, if you remember omni, an easy way to remember these, because invariably you'll run across it in a study Bible or a book, it's just something you typically come across or you hear someone say it. If you remember the word omni is all, so if you think of all, the pre- prefix if you want to say it that way, uh, and if you think of omnipresence, that means God is all what? He's all present. He's everywhere present. I uh, use the example that if someone was in the hospital and I went to visit them and came back and taught this study, the Lord would be present with that person, yet still at the same time present with us here. Now, how does that work? You can ask God one day if he can better explain it. But again, there are certain things that we know about God from the scripture, but God doesn't always expect us to fully fathom them. That's where you can get into heresy and things like that. Sometimes we have to accept by faith these things because we can't fully comprehend them. Uh, And those are one of those. But So when we look at the omnis, if you ever hear omni, just know it's going to be all something. Omnipresent, uh, God is all present. Omnipotence, God is what? All powerful. He has power to do anything. Nothing is impossible for God. That's the idea of what? Remember, I call it ability versus will. God has the ability, and you see that in the life of Jesus, to heal anybody he wants to, but it may not be his will. And Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, I think, is a good example. Paul had the what? The thorn? And he pleaded not once, twice, three times, and God said, not maybe, but no. Did God have the ability? Sure, but it wasn't his will. Um, and so forth. So just remember that. Now tonight we're going to look at uh, omniscience. So this will be the last of the three omnis that are on that uh, sheet there. So omniscience is all what? Well, it's infinite in knowledge, all knowledge. And that doesn't sound as grammatically clear as all powerful. But if you think of omniscience, so you have omnipotent, God is all powerful, Omnipresent, all places, all at the same time, perfectly equal at all same time. Omniscience is infinite knowledge, it's all knowledge. Uh, let me read you this as quote, I'll read it twice if you, want, if you choose to write it down, it's by Charles Ryrie. It's basic theology, he says, God knows everything, things actual, things possible, effortlessly and equally well. That's a good summary in terms of short So again, God knows everything, which is what we already said, but notice how he kind of extends that. He says, things actual, but also things possible. Mind-blowing, isn't it? And then effortlessly, God isn't straining trying to figure things out, but equally well. Now, if you remember, I told you I've appreciated, and this was our first study on the attributes Charles Ryrie refers to God's attributes as his, do you remember it starts with a P? Perfections. God, when he has an attribute, it's perfect. You and I, and I, I'll clarify something just because someone who listens to us online had asked me this. Um, you and I, just remember, we share certain attributes because we're made in God's image. But we share them, remember, only to a certain extent. Even those ones that we do share with God, we're still, if you will, short of all of that. So if you think of mercy, how many of you have been perfect in mercy all of your lives? God has. So just remember, even those ones we share, we share them to a certain degree. Now, in omniscience, we don't share this. This is a unique one 
that only God has. You will never have this, and you will not ever be God. You'll never be like God in, in a lot of these ways, and that definitely crushes our ego a little bit, but if it needs to be, so be it, because that is the case. So one of the things, though, to remember about omniscience, though, is that, and this is hard, I actually think, to even wrap my mind around a little bit, if you ever think about it, is God doesn't have to learn anything because his all knowledge is, what, perfect. Now, you and I have to learn things, don't we? And we have to be reminded of things. But God's knowledge is perfect because he has all knowledge perfectly. All right, so we're going to do the same format that I did before and have been the last few times. I'm going to give you what will be one, two, three, four, five verses. And you can write them down if you want to reference them. And then we're going to look at a couple of them. But let me give just give them to you here. The first one is Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6. So that's Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6. And then we're going to, and then we'll see a, a prophet, Ezekiel 11, 5. The next two come from Romans, Romans 2, 16. And then Romans 11, 33 through 36. And then the last one, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13. So you should have five. Okay, good. Check behind me and make sure that's five. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but uh, let's turn to Psalm 139, and I'll see if we can get a reader for this. Now, you'll remember last week we looked at Psalm 139, and we looked at verses 7 and forward. This week, we'll go back to just the first six verses. Now, as you turn there, and maybe you beat me to it, but Psalm 139, you can see the precision of God in it. The psalm is 24 verses. There's four units. Each unit has six verses. So it's perfectly precise course, what you would expect from God. And what happens is you have verses 1 through 6. Those describe the omniscience of God. And then what we saw last week, 7 through 12, if you remember the omnipresence, uh, excuse me, the omniscience of God, and then we saw the um, omnipresence was last week. So that's verses 7 through 12, if you remember from last week. But at any rate, someone read... Uh, verses 1 through 6 for me, if you don't mind. I'll do it. I was going to say in my Bible, right underneath Psalm 139, it actually says God's omnipresence and omniscience. Yep, and that's right. Um, and if you want to, I mean, I the, the way to remember the psalm is there's four units of six, obviously 24, and the first six, as Merritt said, are the... I'm not, uh, the omniscience of God, the omnipresence would be 7 through 12 if you need to go back and read it, but go ahead. Okay, so I'll help you. Okay, 1 through 6. It is too high. I cannot attain it. So this one is, for me, is probably the best one in terms of explaining it because it has so many pieces to it. Again, if you remember last week, we looked at 7 through 12. That's the next unit of 6. But for this purpose, it's pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? So if you just skim it, God searches us, he knows us, he knows when I go to bed at night, and he knows when I get up. The, again, this is poetic language, and what it's doing is, if you remember last week, not to confuse, but if you look down in verses 8, uh, for instance, and 9, he's ever-present, he shows the four quadrants of creation, in other words, the earth. Here, whether I sit down or rise up, God's there. And he knows. He knows when I go to bed at night, and he knows when you get up. And then if you keep reading it, he knows all of our ways. But notice verse 4. That's what I was referring to earlier with Ryrie's definition. Things actual, things possible. God knows even before something comes out of your mouth what it will be, for better or for worse. <laughs> right? You ever wish you could put your words back in your mouth or put your foot in your mouth before you spoke? <laughs> but isn't that amazing? I love that verse, even before we speak it. 
and the Lord knows it all. And then, of course, verse 5, it gives the idea of hemming someone in, God's hand heavy upon. But notice verse 6, what does he say? You win. Right? I mean, in a sense, you win. I, I don't know how can you be like this. God, how can you know everything about me inward and out, up and down, right and left? You even know what I'm going to say tonight before I go to sleep. And in a sense, how does he end it? You win. I have nothing to do. Right? So there's no way for us to fully, you know, I often think sometimes we get ourselves in trouble even with all kinds of things, whether it's Bible study or just in general, because we only see things, you know, the whole idea of in a mirror, dim, we don't even fully see everything as God does. Uh, But yeah, it's quite an amazing one. But yeah, those verses there to me are the most, if you understand what he's trying to say, but he gets to the end of it and he's like, I give up. I just can't do it. But let's let's uh, let's check this next one, uh, Ezekiel eleven five. Does someone want to read that, or else I will. Sure. All right. Then the spirit of the Lord fell upon me, and he said to me, "Say, thus says the Lord: Do you think house of Israel? For I know your thoughts." Oh wow, it's very similar to what we just read, didn't it? So even if you didn't speak, God knows what you think. Remember when Jesus in the Gospels, a lot of times it makes those references, they're sort of subtle, if you remember, especially in Mark, we've looked at those, I've tried to point them out, Jesus knows what they're thinking even before they do something, again, God in the flesh, so to speak. Um, We won't read both of those Romans ones, but it does, the Romans one I want us to turn to is Romans 11 and uh, verse 33, this would be similar um, in some ways to what Sue was referring to, um, Romans 11.33. Would you read it, Sue, if you don't mind? <laughs> no, no, no race. That's fine. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Yeah, that's Paul's way of saying verse 6, wasn't it, of what we already looked at. And if you were to read the rest, 34 through 36, I mean, who knows the mind of God? Nobody, not really. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, who would actually have the audacity? I mean, I I won't get off on this too much, but uh, I think nowadays we do have people who like to give God their opinions and their counsel, don't they? But uh, same idea, so I just want you to see that, but... uh, you can read on your own Romans 2.16. But uh, I'm going to read the last one here, and then we'll look at a couple of things with this a little more practical. But uh, Hebrews 4.13, um, this one, would be one of those ones you really have to think about. Hebrews 4.13 says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but notice this, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Whew, boy, that one really isn't that make you think, huh? Everything about us is open and laid bare before Almighty God. Um, I wanted to give a couple of things. These are... I don't say practical, but sort of, just three things. And these are three verses. We don't need to turn to any of them. Um, Matthew 10, 29 is the verse where Jesus, in a sense, talks about the sparrows, but it's actually about the numbers on someone's head. You know, that God can count the hairs on our head, which is easy for some people, right? I know, I know some people's heads is pretty easy, okay? But if you think about it, in a sense, he knows every single detail, every single single thing that we have gone through, every single thing we will go through. If you think about that, that's Matthew 10, 26. I mean, the, the detail and the specificity that God would know that about us. I think of Almighty God, Almighty Creator. He has that, if you will, intimate knowledge of us. He's not far off, is he? Again, you see some overlap with some things before God knows us. He hasn't just created us and said, good luck. He's there. Um, I ran across this. I thought it was an interesting quote. It says, 
Though infinitely glorious and gloriously grand, he knows the eternal story of every grain of sand. Sort of the idea. You get the point? I mean, do you think God cares and knows about you? That's what the psalmist is talking about. How could it be that infinite, almighty God could? But yet he does. Another one is that he knows the sufferings and struggles we go through. That's Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. You know, Jesus was tempted, yet without sin. And so he knows and can relate to the things that we experience. And he's our great high priest and he knows all of those things that we have go through. And I've often found it curious. I've had people before come to me and say, well, God, I, I can't pray to God about that because then he'll know what I think. And I'm like, it's too late. <laughs> have you ever, I've had pastor, well, pastor, you just pray about it. Don't tell anybody, you know, but obviously it's too late, right? I mean, God knows. And so I say that somewhat jokingly, but if something is on your heart and mind, you need to go ahead and let it out. The best example of that is that how, is what how you explain some of those psalms. You ever seen and read some of those psalms where David just is just like burn them up, tear them up, throw them. Down, you know, in a sense, that's what you do. You go to God, you pray about it, whatever it is, and then what does David do? He leaves it there with God. Uh, God already knows those things. Um, this other one I thought of too comes from Romans five eight. The Lord knows everything about us, yet he saved us anyway. Yet while we were still what? Righteous and good? No, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So he knows all the details. He knows everything. He obviously cares. There's that intimacy, uh, that knowledge that God has about us. He knows the things we suffer and we struggle through. He knows what you're really like and yet saved you anyway. I will read this and then we'll move on to the next one. Of all God's marvelous transcendent, this wonder of wonders I see, that the God of such infinite greatness should care for the sparrows and me. God cares for us, doesn't he? I mean, he even knows how many hairs you have on your head. Now let's move into the next one. So we've kind of covered omniscience, and I'm going to leave some time at the end, hopefully for some questions, if you have any or comments. This next one is the one that's on the list, righteousness. This one's an interesting one because it has some similarities to two others. Similarity doesn't mean same. It just means similar. Righteousness. Now when we think about this one, one of the things to remember when you talk about righteousness in terms of God is it relates to action. You'll see where I'm going with this in a minute. God acts, I'll read you this, God acts, notice, in a righteous way and desires that we do the same. So when you think of righteousness, it's similar to just and holiness. The way that I distinguish these, I don't know if this helps you, We've already looked at the first two. Holy is who God is. God's holiness is sort of a, if you will, a trait. But how do you distinguish just, do you mean theologically, with righteousness? To judge justly is to judge in a righteous way. Does that make sense? That's the only way I can really kind of distinguish them because they're very similar. Holiness is, in a sense, what God is. God's holy. But when God acts, he acts in a holy manner. That's him acting in a righteous manner. Righteousness, in this sense of an attribute, is something that God does. It's an action. Does that make sense? Whereas holiness is sort of who God is. And so God acts in a way... Um, that is righteous. And I'll see if I can show you this in a few minutes. So it's different than holiness. Righteousness, when you say that, is God acting in a particular way. So action is, is the way that I distinguish it. Uh, let's see if we can clear this up a little bit and we'll look at some scriptures. To say God is righteous means he acts in a righteous, in, excuse me, he acts in righteousness and must demand that all other creatures do as well. Righteousness relates to his treatment of others. So again, 
in order to, for God to act righteously, he acts in a holy way. So I know they're similar, but again, similar is not the same. Let's look at some verses. Let me give you a couple here. Because what you're going to encounter is when you read through the Bible, you'll read that God is holy, he's righteous. How do you put those together? And that's sort of the way I do it in my mind. Righteousness is acting. God typically is showing some sort of action when he's acting in a righteous way. Let's, let's look at some of these verses. I'll give them to you, and then we'll read a couple of them. Deuteronomy 32.4. It's Deuteronomy 32.4. These next two are Psalms. Psalm 89.14. 92.15. So that's Psalm 89.14. And then Psalm 92.15, Jeremiah 9.24, and then John 17.25. Now in John 17.25, Jesus calls God, O righteous Father. You know, I, I mentioned that for two reasons, the word righteous, and then on Sunday morning, what do we call God? Abba, Father. And so Jesus, in, as he prays to the Father, calls him what? Righteous Father, which is what we're looking at. Let's look at um, Deuteronomy 32.4. If somebody wouldn't mind reading that, or else I can. But it's Deuteronomy 32.4. Mark his word, work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Okay. So you can see as a mixture of some of the stuff we've looked at, isn't it? Uh, but God, of course, there being described as acting justly, and in order to act justly, it must be done in a righteous manner. And that's that's sort of the way I think of it in my head. Um, let's move to this next one, Psalm 92, 15. And I'll read that um, since Dave got that one. Psalm 92, 15. So Psalm 92, verse 15, to declare that God is upright, he is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. So again, that kind of weaves in some of these. God has nothing but unrighteousness in him, because why? He's perfect. He's perfect in righteousness. Uh, Jeremiah, I mentioned Jeremiah 9, 24, we won't read. Uh, John 17, 25. But I've been trying to show you, and before we finish, I want us to think about two things. One is, Jesus should reflect righteousness. Let's look at two of these real quick, and then I'll show you how righteousness relates to the believer, uh, which is in two ways, one of which is an action. But uh, let's look at Acts 13, 14. I'll just read these for time's sake. Acts 13, or excuse me, Acts 3, 14, excuse me. And these I just want you to see where, as I've told you before, Jesus should reflect the attributes of God because he's God. Um, Notice, for instance, um, this is uh, Peter's sermon here, the second one, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, But in any case, Acts 3.14, but you disowned the holy, notice, and righteous one, this is referring to Jesus, and ask for a murderer to be granted to you. Uh, You see there that he talks about God, excuse me, Jesus, and he refers to him as holy yet righteous. You see there's a distinction, holy, and there's righteous, uh, referring to Jesus. Now let's turn to the next one, which is 1 John 2.1. 1 John 1.9, we know that one. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness, right? But notice chapter 2, so 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. Jesus is the high priest and he's also our advocate, but notice the description here. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the what? 
the righteous. So again, I just want you to see, as the Father is righteous, so is the Son, which is what we would expect there. That's Acts 3.14 and then 1 John 2.1. Now before we finish, though, how would this relate to a Christian? Meaning, how does righteousness relate to a Christian? And just for brevity's sake, two ways. The first one is, when you and I trust in Jesus by faith, what does God credit or impute to our account? So you and I have a bank account is what? It's not too good, is it? And so God imputes, it means to credit to your account, just like what Sue was talking about. I thought of 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin became sin, but why in that case? So that we might become the what? The righteousness of God. So there is that standing before God, Because as Sue said very well, when you and I stand before God, you will be glad that he won't see you. What does he see? He sees the righteousness of Jesus, if you will, credited to your account, or as you described there, the robes of righteousness is, in a sense, I like to think of it, God will somehow see us in a robe of Christ's righteousness. And, of course, he allows us to uh, enter into the kingdom and so forth. Um, but I told you, righteousness, though, also is action, okay? It should have an active aspect to it. Just as God acts in a righteous way, what do you think he expects of us? I want someone to read for me First John 3.10. Because there is the righteousness that's, if you will, imputed, credited, or clothed to use uh, Sue's description. But that isn't just for us to stand or sit and sour, is it? I mean, there is this active action of righteousness. Just as God is righteous and acts in a righteous way, we should endeavor to be as well. Someone read, and uh, this will be the last one, 1 John 3.10. So we should be known by living righteous lives. Not perfect. Again, God is perfect. God acts always in a perfect, righteous way because he is righteous and he acts that way. You and I now in Christ have Christ's righteousness imputed to us. We don't always act that way, meaning perfectly, but that is a trait that we should see in Christians. Um, I thought this was helpful to try to take it and and see it in the real world. Um, One of the resources I told you uh, that I listed on there is William McDonald's Attributes book, and he does this well with righteousness because again righteousness if we're not careful we might just think we'll have it but righteousness also is action as well just listen to this i think it helps or at least i think it does we should be righteous in all our dealings we will be scrupulously i wish you had used the easier word i figured i was going to stumble that honest our word will be our bond we will avoid anything in the way of shady deals Income tax evasion, bribery, cheating, law breaking, or false weights and measures. You see what he's saying? The child of God needs to act in a way that reflects whose we are. So um, just two things, and then um, I'll take some questions. So obviously these two attributes, there's a lot to think about. But the Lord cares about every single detail in our lives. He knows all the past, present, and future But I thought of, Lord, help me to live a life that reflects you more and more because we should live as the children of God because you'll notice there's a distinction. Children of the devil live in a a particular way. Children of God live in a particular way. And hopefully it's the children of God the way we live. What were you going to add?